Anybody remembers? Yeah, I remember. So we talked about basically three methods. Oh, sorry. These three methods, and uh, do you remember this? This I think we just mentioned, but we didn't talk about them. So did we uh, mention uh, how good these methods were? Oh, what, what was it? Do you remember that? PC was the best. Well, basically, I guess this was difficult to say, but it was somewhere between 50 and 60. This was probably 65% correct, and this was probably 72 or something. Which I mean, depends. But, so, so it's not, but clearly, if you look to the predictions, there was quite a big difference. If it was, if I jump, don't jump through everything, but I jump. I mean, you had particular, you had much fewer these like prediction errors about helix to sheet predictions, for instance. That's a, and also that the secondary structure elements were about the right length. Actually, they look like that in every case here, but traditional, at least in many other cases, these are often very, they're too short, too many, too many loops in between. Uh, and also, you had this reliability here that was kind of telling you when you know where you are correct. And if you have a higher reliability, you're very likely to be correct. What do the stars mean? I think that means, I think, I think it means that the reliability is higher than six, or six, or five, higher than five, you see that? It looks like that. So this part not, this part not. So this is just... Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, if the, the reliability is significant, if it's higher than five, you put a star. It was just visualization and output from, from, from this program. But it, so, that was, so how did this PhD work, do you remember? What, what, what computational, what was, the, what, what was the key uh, data or key information that was used uh, um, that made improvements? Yeah. Are you thinking about like some of the Well, uh, it doesn't use it, it uses neural networks, yes. And. Um, So it uses, you know, but that's not, not really, I mean, but that was one reason why it worked much better, but it, uh, it's really not, was not the, um, uh, the, 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 the reason really worked very bad was because it used multiple things environments. So really, early methods, I don't think, to my knowledge, was no early methods to use it, at least not in a, in a, in a efficient and accurate way. So really, the diff so this is, well, it's not very high resolution, but it's from the paper and they've been processing too many files. So the idea is here that you have a sequence and you start to put in data bank so a sequence, sequence database, find out the hits, you make a you filter these hits in this case not by e-value but by using some kind of criteria which is basically you have some cutoff and said is the, the number rest is aligned versus the sequence identity. This was, was this is pre-blast, so it was way to filter away these alignments and then by making multiple sequence alignment. And this is what they use to input in our network. So really this part here it started with maybe was state of the art, but it was not the first method I think to use it. But really, the parts here that used, I think they, they was basic, at least it was the first one that really worked. Someone might have used it earlier. And the reason why it was maybe wasn't used before, because the, if you look at earlier, for this sequence database was small, so you didn't have any homologs. Even though real paper, they also have like only a few homologs in these these cases. 
And other reason also for that these methods for multiple things alignment so on that kind of automatic didn't really exist and they were kind of computational heavy. So there were several reasons why it wasn't really used before so much. Hmm. And then of course they, then actually in the network they used uh, and now they used I think in Aurelia one they used three different networks. So what they call a sequence a profile to structure network. So when it's which is the kind of obvious thing you have a running sliding window here and you take the input and that and predict the probability being here is the loop on that stage. And then you take the structure sequence to structure net no, then there is structure to structure network. Basically, take the outputs from the first network and put in the second network and use that to predict pre the same thing again. So that is somehow a bit of an averaging or a window, more or less. But but it has some information. It improves a bit. And then I have a neural network to actually make a few different versions of this that are trained in slightly different ways, or, and then take the average of this. That, that I think the key, they really wanted to get the paper up to over 70% and I guess about 69.8 here, so they had to do something else to push up a little bit more higher. Uh, and then make predictions, so, 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 but the idea of these two networks, I think has been more or less standard since this um, paper. I don't think you can really get that good performance on only one network. I mean, they use different ways to implement it, they use different things and different... Uh, methods, but in principle you need something more complex that you can do with a single simple neural network to get the maximum performance. So that was the... And you sort of remember what are the features, but you could have, this is what, like what you're looking for. You look at the physics that they are. For instance, this is a helix. So you have there are amino acids that are more common in helices, like alanine and leucines. And of course, lots of venoms are very common, but they also are even like a bias from the N terminal to the C terminal. So this is a negative charge at the beginning and not so common at the end, and positive charge with the other way around. And that is because you have a dipolar moment so that you want to compensate for. So don't, don't have a big dipole in, the, in your protein. But it's not a huge difference. You see, this is maybe, I don't know. 7% and here maybe it's 5% of that, so it's, it's not used, but it is, there's a tendency like that. And there are, a re, no, there are of course, a number of amino acids like tyrosines and methionines that are very, that are very rare, so tryptophan is very low there. And maybe cysteine, something, valence, something like that? No, valence are up there actually. Oh, this, is, this is not a Y, this is a valine and nice solution, I think. Looks like night, night thing. So anything else you remember? So how good... So what, what do you think is the limit of secondary structure prediction? Why can't we do 100%? Because we are not smart enough. So if you put Google supercomputing networks, uh, deep learning methods to it, do you think they would do much better? It's too much complexity on the patterns and all the things. Um, well, in summary, it's, it's, it's the way we formulate the problem. So we really take the question somehow out. So we basically do a question, I mean, all methods somehow divide the problem into something like that. So you, you look at a window, maybe 20 minutes or something like that, to predict the secondary structure of the central one. But so this is for the protein is also much longer than 20 minutes. So do you think, if you take the same 20 minutes in the protein, and you find one protein and another one, do you think they have the same structure? Well, 20 maybe you would have it, but if you have 10... So like, like, I think the maximum... If you do, took, take things that are in the helix and the sheet, I think the maximum... 
identical sequence you find that in one case it's in the helix, in one case it's in the sheet, it's in the order of 12, 13 amino acids. So they are really, you can have a local, exactly the same sequence, and it can exist in a completely different structural environment. Because, of course, these things are dependent on everything else in the protein. But it is even a whole protein that you can actually do a single point mutation. So 99% so of the protein is identical. Or, and that point mutation makes it go from being mainly alpha helix to being mainly beta sheet. But that is the case where actually the protein structure is uh, sort of exists in two conformations. An alpha helix and a beta sheet conformation, of course. And you have this balance is that if you have one point mutation, it's more alpha helical one, but you can probably change, change the pH, something like that, to the other one. You can move between. So, it's, but there, there, so there are very few mutations that can change that. Mm, yes, so, so of course, this secondary structure prediction does not predict which strands next to each other. So if you have a prediction like this, you of course you have no idea if this sheet is next to that one or that one or that one. No. So that, 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 that for that you need the, the 3D model almost. There has been a number of, well, I'll come back to it, but, but it, historically it's been very hard to predict what is tying up with what. That's, that is, that, that's completely, I mean, it's, it's a much more complex problem. Basically, that's predicting the structure. But you see that even if you don't know that, well, prediction of the beta sheets that can be done to about 65-70% accuracy even without looking at the next one. So it's not, it's one of the things also with the PhD was that actually it was, it had much better beta stand predictions than early methods. Because partly it was because of this reason, because they are really dependent, they are short, I think, but also it was the least common secondary structure class, you had fewer examples, so you kind of, you know, you had to force it not, well, you did, by random, you'd better not pick it at all. So, I'm picking fewer of them. If you want to calculate the accuracy. Anything else? So, so, so back to my question then, why can't, how, how far can we go? Can we get to 100%? And why, am I, I don't think we can. And one reason, of course, is because, as I said here, is that this, it's, Sequences actually, if you only look at the window, you don't have the whole picture. So really, some struct secondary structures are formed by tertiary long distance information. So you can't do it. There is also in somehow a problem with definition. So like if you look at this slide here, when you look at uh, that you had like the good secondary structure methods agreed to like 90, 95%. And this is Basically, they, it's not that they say there's a helix or sheet, it's just that exactly what residues the first one in the helix and the last one is, is a bit of a matter of definition. It's like you, you have to, I mean, you have a hydrogen bond there. If you start, do you define, is it 2.8 ohms or 2.9 ohms? Where do you define a cutoff for a hydrogen bond? Do you have not? And so that, that definition is not, it's a bit arbitrary. And, it, uh, and the same thing if you take two proteins that are very similar in sequence, or even the same protein in two different crystal structures. You end up with numbers that are in this range, also like 90 95%. So that is probably yeah, the definition method that's harder and better. But uh, so we probably could, we could maybe get up to 80%, but then it's going to be hard without modeling the, the whole 3D structure. And that's kind of the feeling. And so that's what we're going to talk about next instead modeling the whole structure. If you have no more questions. And stop this.